everyone, welcome. Um, you have already gotten a small presentation of us. We have Roberto over here from Harling Solutions, currently consulting at Klarna, and me, which is who is apparently some kind of mystery. I've been doing Erlang since 2005, and I have a background in telecoms, and I'm currently working at Klarna as a developer. And we're going to tell you a little bit today about debugging and profiling Erlang systems. So this is what we're going to cover today. A little bit about mindset, what to look for, how to think. A little bit about, a little more about which tools to use and how to use them. And then we have a case study of a sort of well-used and well-known open-sourced Erlang system. So uh, why did we choose to do profile and debugging in the same talk? Well, you are very unlikely to just do profiling. You will not like create a spreadsheet, hand over to someone, and someone else will try to fix why it's slow in, that in those cases. So if you find a bottleneck, you will most likely be, taught, be charged with uh, fixing it too. And you tend to use the same tool set in many cases, at least in the Erlang world. This is what is called, you know, you find, you fix. And regarding the mindset on how to think, it's very important, as everyone knows, to measure and not guess. And one mistake that we'll be doing is that we have not always been trusting our measurements so much. We have sometimes been thinking that we're smarter than our measurements. This is a bad thing. You should let your measurements control what you are optimizing, and you should know what your, measure, what your measurements means. Uh, in case it's not clear, my, the message I'm trying to convey with this slide is that it's important to measure things. So what do you want to measure? On a very high level, on a system level, on the operating system level, you want to keep track of memory usage, your disk performance, how much CPU your usage, if your network is performing okay. And on the Erlang side, the most common things to look for is uh, method queue buildup and reductions. If you are not familiar with the reductions, it's a value that the Erlang scheduler used to determine how much runtime uh, Erlang process get. And in this case, you can consider it a value of how much CPU time a particular Erlang process uses. So it's like CPU per process in Erlang. So how do we find this? We have a number of tools to use that are available for free. Some are included in OTP. The CProf, FProf, EProf, the Observer, DBG, and the Trace pips. Unless you made an effort not to, you already have this in your systems, so these are worth looking at. There's a number of very useful uh, third-party tools like Redbug and Recon, DTOP, Grind. And you also need to have control about your uh, operating system. So you need to use a few tools to diagnose your hardware and your operating system performance. There's a few pointers here where you can start if you're new to profiling, to start reading. I'm not going to cover these tools in detail, so all of them, one by one. I'm going to tell you how we used a few of them to diagnose uh, a problem we encountered. The problem manifest itself like this. We were doing an uh, import of rather large data set into an empty database cluster. And for a long time, we had quite stable performance. But at a certain point, we saw the performance getting much, much worse. What happened was that the time per write uh, started to increase a lot, and the number of writes we could handle in a given time period uh, decreased a lot. And this happened all over the cluster on all the five nodes. And we, there was nothing external that, that affected this, that we could find. Other than, of course, that then that then the data set had increased a bit since the import had been running for a while. So the first thing I do when I encounter something like this is that I fire up something which is called Observer. And uh, Observer is included in OTP. It gives you nice runtime information about your Erlang VMs. So you get shorts of uh, scheduler utilizations, memory usage, IO usage. In this particular one, I can see that the system is doing things. All the schedulers are doing quite a lot of work, 
this seems messy because I had 64 schedulers. It seems to be only running at 30 to 40 percent, but at least it's doing things. Actually, the most interesting thing about this is the IO spikes here that goes back and forth. I will not tell you about this because I have no idea why. Uh, so all I could tell from this is I have a spiked IO, no idea why, but I, I'm not suffering from schedule collapse or anything like that. So what you can also do with Observer, I'm going to talk a little bit about Observer because everyone has it and it's not widely used as far as I know. Uh, you start it as a remote node usually. You don't have to run it on the system you're uh, profiling. So you start it as a remote node and connect to the target node, which is very handy. You can also get the process overview where you can sort on reductions or on memory or on message queue, which tells you a little bit of what the different Erlang processes in your system are doing, which is very useful to find the troublesome ones. So I tend to fire up an observer, connect to the system that's troublesome, and then look at this process chart, sort of message queue or reductions or memory and see which are the troublesome ones. In this example, I've decided that I have a lot of processes with a not insignificant reduction number stuck in the same place. So then I connect to a shell on the system that I'm debugging. And I use something that is called Redbug, which is written by my colleague Mats Grunqvist, who is somewhere in here. It's open source and very nice. It's basically a shortened uh, syntax around the trace bits and the, no, not around DBG, but around the trace, tracing facilities in Erlang. And it's very useful for debugging systems under load without, hopefully without bringing the system down. In this particular case, we spent quite, quite a lot of time on this and uh, found nothing that looked strange. So we followed the code here, look, looked at the source code, see the calls, see if there was anything weird going on. Couldn't find anything. So let's see then how the system is feeling on more on a machine or operating system level. For that, I tend to use something that's called HTOP. It's like a rich man's top, which is much more detailed than top, which you all know and love, or at least know. It gives you detailed information. In particular, you can see on the CPU user graph, you see some red and some green, which is time spent in kernel, which is red, and time spent in user space, which is green. You have some memory information here as well. And uh, here we can see that we are not able to max out the performance. Remember, the problem is that our write performance to disk, uh, to the database is failing. We are not able to use CPU fully, which might be expected when you write into disk, and we are doing almost only syscalls. So since we have see this, we are not maxing out CPU. We know that we have problems writing to disk. You will inspect the disk performance somehow. I tend to use a tool called IOSTAT for that. IOSTAT gives you quite detailed information about how your disks are performing. All these values are average since the last time you ran it or since system start. So I use uh, watch to run it periodically. And in this case, these are from the same system. I see that I do a decent number of writes. And I also see that the latency here, the A weight is in uh, microseconds, if I recall correctly, is very low. And I follow this for a while and see it doesn't fluctuate anything at all. So my disk seems to be doing well. And uh, at this time, life is kind of boring or depressing. You just, your eyes start to tear and you break your keyboard and <laughs> leave early. That's okay, keyboards are, exp are cheap, but I couldn't find anything in the system about messages or memory or CPU, the disks are doing okay, nothing is happening. So that's, let, let's go back to HTOP again, the picture I had here, it's the same picture. And let's see what's happening with the memory. And uh, you see here, we have some memory use, the green ones. And the yellow ones is free or actually used by cache, page caches. So this should be available for allocation. Linux tends to use uh, any free memory for the page caches. But if we look a little bit more closely, we can also see that we have some swap in use. 
So why would we use swap when we have lots of free memory? Well, an educated guess here, I'm not expecting you to answer, as you might guess, is that we suffer from memory fragmentation. It, the, it, we can't find a big enough block in, in the memory, so we need to swap, and the swapping is, that affects performance in a non-positive way. <laughs> you don't want to swap, <laughs> especially not when you have this much memory. And so we could diagnose that a little bit. On Red Hat-like systems, you can get information about memory fragmentation in something which is called body info. I have no idea why it's called body info. But each of these columns represents uh, different sizes of chunks of memory that's available for allocations. And I tend to monitor this, see how it performs under time. And if you see lots of zeros here and there, these are slightly uh, edited figures. But if you see low numbers or things going down to zero and then going up again and problems like that, then you could actually have some problems with memory fragmentation. This might be a problem. It might not be a problem. Some systems can perform well even with memory fragmentation. In our case, it really was the problem. So I tended to drop the page cache so that all operations go straight to disk for a while. That means this yellow thing here will not be visible for a while, it will be black there, only the memory in use will be seen. And uh, that actually took us back to the initial performance. So this is how we identified the problem of a misbehaving Erlang system where we couldn't directly see any measurements that were building up or any resources anywhere. The solution here is rather to, to just drop the page, page cache manually, it's, it's rather clumsy. I don't have a better one right now. In this case, it works because the import is a one-time thing, so when we see it start to behave badly, we just do it, and it goes back to the or original speed. But I don't have the long-term solutions. We probably have to talk to Lucas Nilsson or someone who knows about memory allocation on how to address it. And uh, yeah, here's the moral is, some bottlenecks are sort of hard to find, at least when you don't know what you're looking for. Right, I have a few last words which I couldn't fit into this narrative about this problem properly. If you do not know about the tracing facilities in Erlang, do some reading. They are very powerful and really fun to play with. Slightly complex, and you can fail a lot and bring down systems, especially if you're debugging live systems. You should be very careful, they come with a slowdown. Redbug is very useful for uh, debugging systems um, which are live. What we tended to do, when you use the trace pips, you get a lot of messages spamming your shell or your process collecting them. So we tend to aggregate them into an, uh, into an ETS table and uh, aggregate information about uh, how long time is spent in functions and using ERTS debug size to calculate sizes of return values and argument sizes. But the point is to aggregate it and to calculate the averages as a moving average so you don't have tons and tons of data, which is what happens when you debug a system under load. Also, it's important to remember that your system is not just your Erlang code. It's your entire system with switches and hardware and disks. And even if you're an excellent Erlang programmer, if you're tasked with profiling, you will have to learn your operating system and a bit about your hardware. And which tool you should use, I'm very partial to Observer because it's a very easy way to start. You don't need to do so much. If you cannot use a graphical thing, DTOP is a viable alternative, definitely. So I tend to stop there. And for debugging or light profiling, I tend to use Redbug. And you should measure. And as I showed you in the beginning, it's very useful to actually visualize your measurements as well. And this has helped us tremendously. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Roberto, who's going to tell us a little bit about the war story. Can you, can you hear me? So welcome. Um, I'm here to tell you a story. And this story is about two developers who are profiling again and debugging a system that they've seen for the first time. So they didn't write themselves. And what happened in this kind of cases is that normally, uh, when you perform this kind of profiling, 
you have a, a system under test on one side, and you set up some kind of uh, load generator on the other side, and you start throwing traffic at your system under test. Um, and normally, you wait for the first link which will break, which is your first bottleneck. And you basically try to face your first bottleneck and you iterate over this. So in our case, uh, what happened was um, that the login system actually broke. Um, big disclaimer. Um, I'll, I'll do the disclaimer later, actually. So the way we saw this, it was pretty trivial. So even if you start a tool which is graphical and simple as Observer, you immediately see a process which is jumping up in the list of processes and has a lot of reductions and he's using a bunch of memory and he has a big, he's building up a, a message queue. And these all together are normally the symptoms of something which is going wrong in your system. So let's try to understand what, what happened there. And this little process is called, uh, it's registered under the name of lugger event and it was in, in our system. Um, Lag event is, um, is a process which is part of a very well-known open source project, uh, which is called Lagger. Any of you use Lagger in your projects? OK. Um, so this is a login tool, login framework, which has been um, developed by Basho Technologies. Uh, well, it's a nice tool, provides some really nice API. Uh, to tell the truth, um, this talk is not about uh, anything bad happening in Lager. So more or less, you can feel safe and keep using Lager. There is nothing wrong with it. The problem was how we were using Lager, how the system was actually using uh, the logging framework. Uh, also, we are not currently using the latest uh, uh, version of Lager. So we are stuck on some kind of uh, uh, old branch which has been forked and customized. So all these considerations are I think we are interesting because they highlight general Erlang issues, but they're not specific to the, to the Lagger framework. Um, so Lagger is this uh, nice framework which comes as an Erlang application. Uh, you can include it in your release. And he has this concept of a, of a log manager so that you can log things, log messages. So you have a lot of clients in your code which will send log requests to the log manager and you can install one or more handlers into this event manager so that you can perform uh, different actions every time you receive a log request. Um, it's easy to configure, so that's our like a simplified version of our configuration file for Lager, where for the Lager application in our sysconfig, we just specify a bunch of handlers uh, for the log manager. So one the first issue that you have with Lager is that it has um, an interesting architectural choice. So it's basically based on GenEvent. Um, you probably are already aware of this, but in Erlang, when you use the Erlang GenEvent behavior, the actual code which is run in the event manager and the actual code which is running in the event handlers run inside the same context, inside the same process. So Despite of what people believe, the gen event doesn't work in, some, in a similar way where you have a client sending requests to managers and you have like linked handlers, which are separate processes. Gen event in Erlang is more like this, where a client sends requests to a manager and then you execute a bunch of functions on that event. And all these functions run in the same context. So, I mean, this should be fairly obvious, and if you read the documentation, that should be pretty clear. But the moral like that should take home is whenever you use the gen event uh, Erlang behavior, you should try to avoid a blocking or synchronous call in your handlers. You should try to use your um, event manager in a very lightweight fashion. So the event manager, the guy who is coordinating these entire things, should be more considered like a, a dispatcher than anything else. Should spawn processes whenever you think this is a meaningful thing to do. You should try to avoid doing things like sending an SMS synchronously in one of the handlers, because that's going to affect the performance of your uh, system seriously. And you also should try to avoid um, having too many handlers installed in the same 
gen event or in the event manager. Or you might end up with this, which is a screenshot from Observer, which can also um, show the layout for your Erlang applications. So this is actually the system we were profiling. And that little guy there is actually our Lager event, our event manager in, in Lager. So I think we can definitely say we, we have a bit overused the login system in this configuration. And maybe we could refactor this to something better. OK, so that was a long introduction on uh, like Gen Event and Event Manager. And we are all aware that there is this uh, event manager with a bunch of handlers. And we cannot keep up with the job. And we are building up a queue in the event manager. So the first question we should ask ourselves is, why is um, having such a big queue a big problem? Aside from obvious reason, like, of course, I have a big queue, so uh, I'm consuming memory, and I have a process which cannot uh, keep up with the, with the load. But there is um, another tiny reason, which some people are not aware of. And in Erlang, every time you send a message uh, to a process, which has a huge mailbox, you get punished. How many of you knew about this? That's a start. So when I say you get punished, I literally mean punish. The, the flag, which is used in the in beef.c code for punishing a process is actually called the earth use sender punish. Uh, what it does is, if you have a process which sends a message to a process which has a huge mailbox, your reductions are bumped by four for each message which is in the queue of the receiving process. And we ended up with an event manager, with a log, logger event, with 400,000 messages. This means basically that every time a client process is trying to log things or to use like an event manager, we'll immediately bump reductions and we'll be scheduled out immediately. So if you have a, like a large mailbox like we had, you really, really slow down the rest of the application. In reality, it's a bit more complicated than this because each Erlang process has two, two mailbox, like an internal one, an external one, and processes send messages to the external mailbox, and there is an internal logic so that you pass messages from the external mailbox to the internal one, and then the local process will consume messages from the local and internal mailbox. But the idea is if you have a, a big a process with a huge mailbox, that's a bad thing. So try to avoid that as much as possible. And, or you end up with something like this, where the white thing there is your lagger event, which doesn't really know what to do. And all these black things are like processes which are trying to send messages in their slowdown. Um, of course, like in the case of lagger, the Basho guys knew about this. No big surprise. They're clever guys. So they, they had some kind of overload protection in Lager. And in the first version of Lager, they had a most simplistic uh, form of protection. They used synchronous logging. So every time you were sending like a log request, it was, it was using like a gen event sync notify, so that you couldn't ever build up a queue in the event manager. Of course, people complained about this. And they say, it's like, this is seriously, like, this is a Erlang, this is a login framework, should have some asynchronous login support for sure. So in the, in the second version of Lager, uh, they introduced this uh, asynchronous threshold, where basically the way it works is, by default, all logging is asynchronous, as you would expect, but then they monitor the length of the queue for the event manager. So every time you pass a certain threshold, which is configurable, these laggers switch to synchronous mode for like self-protection. And then you can configure like the way to go back so that when situation go back to normality, then you switch back to asynchronous mode. Of course, you can have uh, different views about this. And I think they are best summarized by the, the unicorn versus the, the blurch. This is an actual discussion in, uh, oops, in the lagger pull request when they introduced this asynchronous threshold. So 
the unicorn is the unicorn basically is saying, um, yes, I understand um, you have problems with uh, building up a queue, but having synchronous logging means pushing pushing back the load to the rest of the application. So if your logging system cannot keep up with the work, uh, you're slowing down the entire application. And then the blurge replies, uh, well, you don't have so many alternatives. Uh, the logging framework is uh, a crucial part of your system, and if the logging framework is not working correctly, uh, there is no much that you can do. So this is some kind of form of like back pressure that you want to do. And, and if you still want, you can still disable because you can configure, you can disable this behavior. You can uh, still configure the asynchronous threshold to a very high value and have asynchronous logging anyway. Um, so we were not sure about how things worked, so we did a couple of attempts and we tried to play with uh, synchronous logging and it was not good enough. It was uh, was not fast enough, and then we tried to switch to asynchronous logging. We had some kind of in-between implementations where uh, you could set like asynchronous severity for different, like asynchronous levels for severity of the messages, so that, for example, error and critical errors are always synchronous, and then warnings and info debug messages are asynchronous. These kind of things. So I will save you the details on all the analysis we did. But while doing this analysis, while doing this profiling and debugging and trying these things, we notice a couple of interesting behaviors. And one of this is we were throwing traffic at a system. We were profiling. We have, a, uh, as Martin said, we had our own custom profiler, which was collecting information about what was going on in the system. Uh, but also at a high level, we realized that after we stopped, so we, we were throwing traffic and the queue for this event manager was building up. And then we were stopping the load generator and we noticed that a lot of activity was still visible in, for example, HTOP. And all the activity was restricted to one single core. So we started using DTOP in this case, uh, where you could use Observer or whatever. And then we realized that was still, the lugger event process was still choking up he had a very big queue, and he couldn't keep up with the, with, the, with the load. But there was no load at that time. So, of course, there was some backlog for the event manager. We had many requests in the queue, which we needed to log. And we need to write these things to, to file, for example. But there was no I.O. weight visible in the system at all. So we started monitoring things, and it's like, Lugger event has a, a bunch of messages. It's trying to write them to disk. We are not I.O. bound. We have one single scheduler which is doing a lot of stuff. What's going on? So we started with Observer, and we noticed that uh, a function uh, in the table where you have a list of processes, the Lugger event was constantly spending time in the file write function. And then we started digging into that. And we started again with Redbug. And I don't know if you're familiar with Redbug, but it's uh, extremely nice. So this is basically starting a tracer for the file module write function. And if you specify this in this kind of Erlang style syntax format, return, you basically get two messages. You get a message every time you call the file write function, and you get a message every time you, uh, you get the return value. If you specify this uh, option, RFT true, Every time you receive this kind of messages, instead of receiving the log message itself that you are logging, so the argument for the file write, you just get the arity, which is quite useful for us. And also you have this other option, print milliseconds, which will basically display uh, the, the exact milliseconds where you call the function and where you return. So it's really simple to make the difference and try to understand like how much time you spend in a function. So we are talking about like one liner which you can write without any like complicated fprof analysis or whatever this is like one liner you can do it it's easy so what we realized was um, every single file write operation in our case was taking uh, like up to 12 milliseconds which was an enormous amount of time we had 400,000 messages in the queue and that's basically like one hour to catch up without any load <laughs> 
And then we started digging into the code of Filebrite, and we realized our lesson number two, which is the, the cost of Filebrite is directly proportional to the length of the message queue of the writing process, at least in R15. I think I saw some changes in the latest version of Erlang, so in 17 should be different. So, okay, try to explain me why this is true. And the reason is, this is a simplified code snippet from the io.erl module. Every time you perform an io request, uh, what happened there is that, well, you do some stuff, but the idea is that you send an io request to a process, and then you receive a reply. If you have a long message box, like a, a, a huge queue, uh, a message queue, this is a selective receive, so it has to go through the entire mailbox, which explains why we were spending 12 milliseconds for, doing a, for writing a single line of text into disk. Um, there are a couple of workarounds to this, and most of you are probably familiar with this. The, it's well known in the community as the make ref trick. So this is um, the workaround. It, the workaround is basically exploiting an optimization which was introduced in R14, uh, where the idea is if I create a reference with make ref and I send that in a message and I immediately receive, there is an internal optimization, and this is not our job. This was mainly guys like Tobias pointing us in the right direction. Um, if you do like this kind of trick, basically the VM is clever enough that if you use a, if, if you specify this reference and you send it and you immediately match on the same reference, internally will optimize things so that it doesn't have to go through the entire mailbox. So you basically solve the problem. But in our case, if we want to solve this for the file write, it means that we have to fork OTP, and we need to modify that piece of code, and we need a patch, and this seems like a bit complicated. So we went for a simpler alternative. Uh, the problem was that all the clients were sending this log request to the event manager, which was our logger event, and one of the handlers, which was one of the, like the file backend in, in logger, basically, was performing the file write. But since, as I said, that function, the, the handler is executed in the same process as the event manager, that was basically lagger event, the process which had a huge mailbox which was executing the file write. So we just did the simplest possible thing. We spawned a new process, a middleman process, so that a client sent a message to a manager, and we have another process which is executing the file write. The request between the manager and the, the middleman process is synchronous, so we actually add more stuff in here, but since this process has never like a, a queue, the file write was much faster. So in situation like when you have 400,000 messages, we saw this decreasing, like the, the queue decreasing much faster, and we measure this and we noticed that instead of 12 milliseconds, we were spending less than a millisecond per write, which was kind of nice. Um, for you, the good news is that this is a very trivial piece of code, uh, but we released it as open source. So under the Klarna account, there is this uh, lagger middleman backend, which is, uh, again, 20, 30 lines of code. And it's pretty simple. Uh, you take your lagger configuration, where whatever you have your file backend, you wrap it into this middleman, and this will do the spawning for you. So you, you have this working. Um, of course, this is a profiling talk, so you want numbers. And you should never believe me if I give you, tell you stories. So we actually tried this, and we performed some stress testing. And so we had our own system, this was done on this local machine just for this uh, talk, so numbers are not impressive. Uh, but we have our lagger system, which has three file handlers installed. This means that every time I log something, this gets written into three different files. Um, six concurrent workers are sending log requests. Each of them is producing 100 log uh, requests a second. Each message is one kilobyte and we tried this simulation for like 10 minutes 
if you do the math, you should come up with uh, uh, 1,800 file write operations a second. So what we noticed was uh, this graph. This is representing the, uh, l the growth of the, the message queue in the lagger event. So the blue, uh, the blue line is without the middleman. You can see like a, we are immediately building up a queue. At this point, we stop the simulation because the system is uh, getting unresponsive. So we have this uh, rule of thumb. When the system was at 80% of memory, I stop. Otherwise, I lose control of my machine. Um, so it was, it's really steep. And then the decreasing is really slow. So all this part of the graph, we basically don't have any load. So this is just to catch up with the backlog. If you apply the middleman, it's slightly better. We can uh, continue a, a bit longer. And then the decrease is uh, slightly faster as well. And the interesting one is if you look at times for file write, it's really nice because in the case of the middle of the original file backend in Lager, which is the blue line, you basically have like at, at the beginning you have a like a constant behavior, and at some point you start building up a queue, and then you get this nice behavior. So. This is the time for executing a single file write. But if you use a middleman which has an empty mailbox, all the time is uh, really constant. So the middleman, uh, we can say basically in our case, helped is not like a definite solution, but it's useful, for example, for bursts of traffic. If you have a burst of traffic and then maybe if you don't use the middleman, it's a bit bad the situation, but if you use the middleman, you can keep up with the load and it's easy to recover. And I think I'm done. And they asked me to put this. So I, I, I represent Atlan Solutions. Um, Martin is representing Klarna. They are both hiring, so if you're interested. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Yes. We have several. Uh, I don't know, maybe you tried uh, Yemalloc. I don't know how you pronounce that. It's another Malloc, Yemalloc, and I don't know if you had the chance to try this one, maybe? No, we have not. We toyed around with that. Many people were like, I don't know if the people audience has experience, but sounds like very uh, many times it brings up people, systems up by yeah. switching to this one. That is definitely on the list to do, but we have not tested it yet. So. I saw somebody there, yeah. <clears throat> so what's the final place for the parts? Is it the uh, OTP distribution with a change in the uh, I.O. protocol, or is it Lagier with uh, these parts included in there? So you mean what solution we use for the lagger? No, no, I mean, now you have this extra branch, but it should be either integrated in ODP, I guess, or in Lagger. What do you think? No, OK, so we have um, we implemented this um, Lagger middleman backend, which, sorry, this one. And this is an external application. So if you're using Lagger, you can just include this as an external application. And every time you specify the backend, instead of specifying um, File backend, you just put lagger middleman backend, and you wrap. So it takes the original tuple as, a, um, as an argument. So is it not compatible with the I.O. protocol itself to, you know, you can't, can't you include this in OTP, for example, to happen for every time that you do a file You mean write? for the gen event in general? No, no, the, or the file write itself, since it's using the I.O. protocol. Oh, the file write. Stuff. So the file write, it, when I looked at the, um, at the latest master, it seems not to have this problem. Mm -hmm. So it's been fixed. Okay. Uh, so I don't think that's a problem. Cool. But in general, this is a, a problem. Like if you, even the make ref trick, I think that's, uh, I mean, I know there are some evil things which have been implemented and... Uh, internal checks to verify that the like generated code it actually contains the internal optimization these kind of things but I, I wouldn't use it i would solve it in other ways so this was a simpler way um, in our case like my my point of view on this is that we just overuse lagger uh, and we use it not in the 
correct way. We had this problem only because we are we have like I don't know nine different file backends and a lot of other stuff installed. So Genevent is not the right choice for that. But something to keep in mind. It's not just related to the I/O system. D even the disk log suffers the same issue. So every time you have a process which is doing something. And if this process has a huge mailbox and you do a request and you do a selective receive, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Anybody? No? Then thank you for the presentation. Thanks. <laughs>